This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. He gave me a book on art forgery. I found myself drawn to these old masters. How did these artists take paint from a palette, arrange it on a canvas? I began to unlock the secrets I was a storehouse of knowledge of how to create an illusion, present it to a experienced expert, manipulate his mind, and convince him and bring him to the inevitable conclusion that the painting is genuine. We flooded the market with my paintings, and I couldn't believe what I did. I couldn't believe it. Then the dominoes started falling, and eventually the FBI were led to my door. They uncovered a mountain of evidence against me. But they never actually got you. At this point, you've sold a lot. You've got like a million dollars in cash. You sold (laughs) one painting for 717000 Why did it go away? Why did you never get indicted? How are we having this conversation? (laughs) I guess that's the greatest story of all. To hear how Ken Perenni made millions in art forgery, dodged the mafia and the FBI, subscribe to The Jordan Harbinger Show and check out episode 282 in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. This week on the podcast, I am very excited to have the great John McWhorter. John McWhorter teaches linguistics, American studies, and music history at Columbia University. He is a contributing editor at The Atlantic and host of Slate's Lexicon Valley podcast. McWhorter is the author of 20 books, and he stopped by to talk about his most recent nine nasty words, English in the gutter, then, now, and forever. I think you'll enjoy this conversation. Lord knows I did. I'm with John McWhorter, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins Welcome. Thanks for having me, Bridget. Thank you. I know you're a very popular requested podcast guest for Walk-Ins Welcome. We've had many, many people very excited that you're coming on. You have a lot of fans in That's my audience. Yeah, they love <laughs> you. I am I really just want to talk to you about so many things, but we'll start with why we're talking, which is you have a book out, a new book, Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now, and Forever. What inspired you to write this book? Um, I wanted first to write a book about language that people would really want to read. To tell you the mm-hmm. truth, it's the one of the few times I've written a book with the goal of having a book that might really get around. I don't usually expect them to really get around, but I thought just once I'd like to have one that was at least a minor hit. And I thought really there are maybe three linguistics topics where you can be pretty sure of that. One is writing about universal grammar and Steven Pinker did that. The other would be saying that language is going to the dogs and Lynn Trust did that back about 20 years ago and that was a big hit. Then the other thing actually is writing about language in the internet and Gretchen McCullough took care of that two years ago and I thought the only one left is cursing. I figured people are going to want to know about curse words and I thought you know I wouldn't mind doing a deep dive into that for a little bit and so I did and so I think Nine Nasty Words because of the moment that we're in is thought of as the book that John McWhorter wrote about the n-word and then he padded it out with some other curse words because he's black (laughs) and contrarian the book was really about fuck and then the n-word was something where i thought i guess i have to do that too even though i've done it before but you can't leave it out but you know i'll take it where i can get it and so if it's the n-word book okay but to me really it's the fuck book and then you have to pad out fuck with a bunch of other things and that have to include the n-word I love the line you have you're just such a great writer and it's just so many words jump out and images and you said among english's words fuck is like that guest who arrives unseen but is seated with their drink by the time someone tings a glass to inaugurate the festivities (laughs) what a great image for this word that just seems to kind of have appeared 
And yeah, as a linguist, do you labor over the language or is it effortless like a martial artist with an unseen discipline? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. People don't usually ask me about the writing process. You know, to be honest, I know I'm supposed to say that I labor over every word. You're not. And I have to drink to write. No, the truth is I am a ridiculously fast writer. I don't know where it comes from. I just sit and it comes out. I can do thousands of words in a sitting. And then, of course, I polish. But really, what I do is I just write what's in my head. I write the way I talk. And then I clean it up somewhat. But no, once I get going, and I always have a kind of a rough outline, it just it's what I think I'm born to do. And it's not not fiction. I, I think I'd write a terrible story. I don't I doubt if I'd be good at that. But in terms of teaching on paper, writing nonfiction, it just often it feels like someone else is writing it. So I yeah, know. it just just happened. So nine nasty words was written. I, I won't even say how quickly, but once I get going, it just it just comes. It's just it's weird. I understand that actually. That's what my experience when I'm in the flow and I too can just sit down and flow, write. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There's something I do and I have said the same thing. It feels when I'm in those moments, like I'm being channeled. There's a lot of other writing that I'm mm -hmm. horrible at, but there are <laughs> particularly that I hate to say in my instance, it's a, a little bit more of the navel gazy inward looking kind of reflection about right. something that might be going on. Those just kind of pour out of me and I, I, I too can write a thousand words in an hour, you know, just an easy yeah, sitting. Yeah. And then I see people who kind of labor over every word and I'm like, I can't. I feel sorry that. for them. I used to think that what we're like was normal. And then gradually right. I realized, no, this is kind of a kink. And for many people, it doesn't just flow that way. But yeah, if you've got that flow, it's, it's a lucky thing to, to have. You Did know. your love of language and writing come first or it seems you know language is obviously history and one of the things that i love about etymology and linguistics and all of the things you study is that so much of a study of history did that were they both parallel or was it you just loved writing in words and then started studying language and found out that history is a massive part of this huh i love both of those things. Mm -hmm. Language is not necessarily language. That might surprise some people. I've never been somebody who thought that much about language in the abstract, but linguistics, there being other languages that I don't know and I want to know them for no real reason. That's me starting at age four, just hearing another language was Hebrew and not thinking, oh, I can't understand them. And now let's go play in the sandbox. For me, it was, I can't understand her. I want to be able to do that. And I mean it. And I thought that was normal. And then once it wasn't until I was about 30 that I fully realized most people don't hear foreign languages in that way. It's just they have other fish to fry. It's a kink that some people like me have. But then also um, history. I'm really interested in how we got to now. History is always interesting to me in that way. And especially what it would be like to live in another time and often a pretty close time. Like I would give anything to be turned white just for this to walk around in 1936 for a week, just a week. You know, and it was a barbaric time. Wouldn't want to be black then. So I'd want to be white for that week. Right. Just <laughs> walk around and just, you know, the cigarettes and the music and how people talk. It'd be so interesting. So your history and language, which means that in linguistics, my specialty is not, as I think many people would very reasonably think, how people feel about the way they talk and how language varies according to social class, et cetera. I can talk about those things, but what really interests me is how language changes over time, what it would have been like to try to talk to Chaucer, something like that. Mm. So yeah, that's where it all comes from. Yeah, I'm really, this is really where I'm fascinated with language is how it evolves and how even I've been thinking a lot about this. I grew up in the likes and I still try to catch it. I, I call them the likes because it was like everywhere. And I remember my dad scolding me and saying it's not like, and there's this great book mediated and he actually tackles this word and how it does appear at this time where everything is becoming heavily mediated and we're looking for a, and the video is just becoming ubiquitous and we're trying to explain a way that something might feel instead of something we read or said. 
And it's a long, interesting essay that I'm probably butchering, but I, I will I will send you a reference to it when we're done. And you, I was thinking something. I was thinking about like to literally, and you mentioned <laughs> this word in your book briefly. Mm-hmm. Just the evolution of that word that means not what it means. And I heard somebody mm-hmm. giving a TED talk and they literally said literally. They sounded like a teenager almost. And this was a uh, probably man in his 60s. So this is mm-hmm. this is now in the boomer. The boomers are now using literally incorrectly. Oh, yeah. What do you think about the evolution of these these words that don't mean what they used to mean? <laughs> and mm-hmm. and what would your guess be for the next? What is that called? Actually, that term for a a, a word like a word such as like or literally. Mm-hmm. Well, like is a discourse particle, and there was a time of likes. It just jumped after the 1970s and particularly the 80s. And, you know, as a linguist, I'm supposed to say that it's just this random development and that language always changes. There's more. It's a story that I might get around to trying to tell. The book on like has been, there's actually a whole book on it, written by a linguist, Alexandra Darcy, and she nails that this thing just jumps out of nowhere and suddenly it's in Canada, it's in Australia. But the idea that it just kind of happened and it has nothing to do with culture. I can say that. I'm supposed to say that, but I don't believe it. I think that it has something to do with yeah, mediation. Mm -hmm. I think it's sophistication. I think that we are more spontaneously aware of other frames of mind now than we were, say, in 1936. I think it has something to do with that because I want to say, well, we say like now, but uh, 200 years ago, it was the same thing with some other word, but it wasn't that way. There was no equivalent to that 200 years ago. And then with literally, you're dealing with what's called a contronym. And everybody jumps on poor little literally. You know, the first attestation of that, I'm almost sure, is in the 1700s. So it's not oh. only 60-year-olds. It goes way back. But wow. people don't like it. But you know how something can be stuck fast and then you can also run fast? Well, those are right. completely opposite. You know how if you seed a watermelon, you know it doesn't mean that you're putting the seeds in it. Right. And yet you can you know, put seeds in the ground. There are about 75 of those words. Okay. Literally is one of them. And for some, it's like that kid in fifth grade who everybody started picking on for no reason. Literally just gets singled <laughs> out like that. And so literally is just doing what words do because it became figurative as words often do. And because it originally happened to mean by the letter, a certain kind of person hears it and thinks it's being used wrong. But no, no, it's actually quite normal. Uh And um, I write about literally actually in an earlier book I wrote called Words on the Move. It's an interesting story, but all it is is a humble little contronym. It's so weird, though. It just seems to, even though it's a humble little contronym, it has really (laughs) taken its place in the culture and particularly Gen Z. I was listening to these teenagers talk and every other, it sounded like me and my friends saying like, but now it's like literally. (laughs) It's because we like to like to be vivid with one another. The idea is I'm being sincere. Do you understand what I mean? There are always ways of checking that you are being understood and that the person knows what you mean and to indicate that you're sincere. Those, as dull as it seems, indicating your sincerity and checking the other person's frame of mind are fundamental aspects of this thing called human language of communication. Mm. There are always little bits and pieces and ways that a language does that. And yet like is one thing. Like is wearing out to an extent. It's mm-hmm. spreading out. It's, it's Sometimes it really does seem like it's becoming just punctuation, although it's more complicated than that. Literally starts to take up some of that function. And as time goes by, there'll be, there'll be other things. Vernacularly inclined Black man might say, you know what I'm saying? And the way it really comes out is saying, uh-huh. saying you could spell it M-S-E-H-N. Blah, 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 saying. It's one of these words that's just emerged to say, do you see what I mean before I go on? All human speech has ways of doing that and literally happens to be becoming one. Interesting. I find it really fascinating during this time that we are all interacting virtually as well. There's this determination to try and make some something seem IRL or analog or it, mm-hmm. it's like almost like an analoging of the virtual. I see people kind of interacting this way. I too have an interest in the evolution of words, words themselves. I always want to know where they 
come from swear words in particular, like you mentioned in the opening of your book, it's the first thing you learn in a foreign language. I was married to a Belarusian in my (laughs) twenties and you know, the first things you learn are all the dirty things to say. And do you hear a lot of people's stories about the first time that they swore? I don't hear those stories a lot. What I hear from most people is either why do people curse so much these days Mm. or what will the new curse words be? My first curse word was hell. And my mother literally, literally (laughs) washed my mouth out with soap. Oh, wow. It It was life boy soap. And she said, don't you ever say that again. And that's because in 1970, hell still counted somewhat as profanity if coming from a five-year-old boy. I think that was my first curse word. Where where were you raised? Philadelphia. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what did your parents do? Um, what my parents did was they were very middle class. And okay. so I, I want to portray an, an almost sitcom kind of upbringing, except that they were both very angry people who drank too much. And okay. so it was kind <laughs> of like it was kind of like living in ordinary people, except on a very beautiful set. But that was um, my life. And my mother was a professor of social work and my father was a university administrator. And um, so it was that kind of, you know, very middle class um, upbringing, you know, Volvo and a Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. And you were not supposed to walk around saying hell when you were five. And so you had to eat life boy soap. That was my upbringing. I remember the first, I was, your book got me thinking about my first time saying the swear fuck, actually. And mm-hmm. I had learned there was this next door neighbor of mine. I was in private Catholic school with nuns. It was first or second grade and probably around first grade. And this young, precocious neighbor of mine, she was the one who also ex- ex- explained what sex was. And she said, do you know F.A.? means fucking asshole. It doesn't, by the way. I don't no, know. <laughs> I've never heard that in my life <laughs> ever said. No. It's not a thing. <laughs> F-A. And, <laughs> yeah, I've never heard it. <laughs> and I was like, what? And I just was so I I was so shocked to hear those words. I I viscerally remember her telling me, do not tell anybody. And I swore that I wouldn't. And then mm-hmm. I went to school the next day and I I remember the feeling as we sit here and talk, not being able to keep that secret in my mouth. I told everyone in the cafeteria that <laughs> F.A. meant fucking asshole and went home and <laughs> sat behind the chair in the head because <laughs> I knew I did something wrong. And I was a good kid and the phone started ringing and my dad gave me a whooping. He made me walk up three <laughs> flights of stairs and our, we had an attic and he like gave it me sounds a... sounds like a sinister cartoon uh, where you're walking up the steps. And that was what go. I remember. The, I remember looking at my pink. It's so vivid. I remember it as if I was whatever age, seven years old. So, but I, more importantly, I remember that. And I don't know if it had something to do with being in Catholic school and just I could not keep those words in my mouth if I had wanted to keep them out. And there is something so sacrilegious about using the word fuck, particularly when you're surrounded by nuns and habits. Nuns. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Or when you're surrounded by Montessori school equipment, because I learned the word when I was about eight Mm -hmm. and somebody scrawled it on a box one of the educational boxes (laughs) and the teachers had us all just sit down and be (laughs) silent until somebody fessed up. And of course, if you're eight to sit for longer than about 30 seconds, this is if you're sitting for a week. And so a friend of mine did a false confession because he wanted us all to get up and he knew that he wouldn't be punished too much because his mother worked at the school too. Oh, wow. And it was true. I always wonder who did do that. But that was how <laughs> I learned that word and its power. I don't think I knew that it referred to sex. I just knew that it was a bad, bad word. I don't remember when I learned what fucking was. I must have known by 12. But I said, yeah. oh, I remember how I learned it. It was, um, remember that the, the other Judy Bloom book, Forever. I think if if fucking is ever said in forever, I would have learned it from that because I learned an awful lot of terminology from that book. And that was when I was 11. But yeah, I knew it was a bad word to me. 
I mean, good for your friend for throwing himself on the grenade there and allowing you all to go free. Thank you, Richie Chapman. That's Wouldn't right. it be mm-hmm. funny if you today, right now, confess that it was you who wrote that <laughs> word? <laughs> That makes it a better story than I did it. That's right. You're like, and I've never told anyone. And now (laughs) I say, you know, after 1973 has gotten far far enough away. Yeah, but no, it really, it wasn't me. And I remember almost all the kids in the class. I can guess who it probably was, and he was never going to admit it. So I'm glad Richie stood up. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know, I know, every day somebody tells you you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Recently, Jordan sat down with Neil deGrasse Tyson for a fascinating conversation I think a lot of my listeners will love. He also recently sat down with Nicholas Christakis. Nicholas is the author of Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. And he talks about the lessons you can learn from the pandemic, what past disasters tell us to expect on the road ahead. Just such an interesting conversation. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. One of the things I love about your book is the evolution of what types of words become profane. So mm-hmm. it's the damn and the hell and the God, and you couldn't even say those things. And then, then it evolves into these, I guess, bodily functions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it goes from, it goes from religion to the body, which is an interesting mix. <laughs> and parts uh, of your body, right? yeah. yeah, parts of your body are, are having fornication. Can't have that. And now we have these words that, as you mentioned, the N word and I think the R word, retarded, is another one of these words that are... I would go with you on that. Yeah, yeah they fall into this category of, I don't even know, how would you define this transition? Well, I would just say that we have new profanity. To okay. tell you the truth, if there were only damn hell, fuck shit, ass, dick, et cetera, if that was all there was to write about, I don't think I would have written nine nasty words because there'd be no arc. There'd be no story. It would just be a collection of things. And lists is not teaching. You get bored after three things, you know, right. with any list. If I say dog, cat, now you're wondering what else. Giraffe. <laughs> Notice that you don't really care what the fourth one would be. And so it would be the same thing with the curses. But I thought, wait a minute, there's a story. It starts with the blasphemy, which mm-hmm. is no longer relevant to, I think, most English speakers as profanity. Then it's the body. And that's what we really do think of as profanity. And yet... Frankly, if you're under about 60 and maybe 70, you use a lot of those words so much that they don't make any sense as profanity. It's not that people curse more. It's that the words aren't curses anymore. I say fuck several times a day, and I'm a rather starchy person. It's not because I'm profane. It's because that word has lost a lot of its power. But we have new profanity, which is the slurs, which in our mental orbits occupy the same space as, say, fuck did in our equivalents 100 years ago. So it's just that there's a story. It goes from blasphemy to the body to slurs against groups. And if anything, that's an advance intellectually and morally. But it means that we do still have profanity. It's the words that we really don't want to use and people get in trouble for using. Mm -hmm. And it's the N word and the F word that has six letters, the C word for women. You know, the things that even here I'm you know hesitant to even say. That's because they are profanity in 2021. Yeah. I wonder, as we talk about words losing meaning like profanity, I see this process happening with a lot of things that I would have considered a slur growing up. And now I've been called things like racist or I get called it, I guess, like a transphobe a lot or all of these things that Mm. were once held. I mean, being called racist as somebody who grew up with a very liberal grandmother and (laughs) was like JFK and alcohol and Jesus in our family. Um, those are, that was the Holy Trinity. 
she I can was, relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she was so open minded. She ran a bed and breakfast in a in a resort town. They were always teaching us to be grateful. They were greatest generation types, World War II. And just the the worst thing we could ever be called in our life was racist. Mm -hmm. It was like, and that was the same with my parents. I that you can swear you can say these things, but if I ever find out you're saying anything racist, you're getting locked away <laughs> for a very long that, time. Right. That it's profane. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you went back to 1936 traveling, you would find, you know, respectable, educated people saying things that would make our, you know, our hair stand on end today with nobody calling them anything. And it was only in certain circles where if you were told you were prejudiced, you would get somewhat upset. But it was not the equivalent of being called a pedophile. That's right. how things have changed. And in many ways for the better right. in our times. But that means that the language surrounding those things becomes what an anthropologist would recognize as profane. We don't want to be called racist. And of course, you know, I, of course, even get called racist sometimes. And I shudder in a way that I wouldn't have if I were a white person in 1936. I mean, I say this as my grandmother has, you know, an entire scrapbook filled with all of the headlines and it's all Japs and you know my grandfather using nips and the letters he wrote from the <laughs> South Pacific so I say that they they were absolutely uh, they abhorred racism in all its forms while being what we would consider extremely racist. They would say that's not racism but yeah <laughs> yeah we we have a more refined conception of it than they do. But yeah. now that word itself, racist, gets thrown around so loosely, I worry that it's losing its power and meaning as well as some of these even swear words. Do you? Well, see, yeah. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do see that. Yeah. That, um, we've gotten to a point where the word is used as a bludgeon to enforce a kind of ideological lockstep. And I think that's a problem in our current culture because, of course, racism exists and racism is not just the N word. It's not just burning crosses on anyone's lawn. This concept of systemic racism, I find the term awkward, but the concept is real mm -hmm. and it's something people should think about. But the idea that anybody who has any questions about the ideology of a certain very hard left contingent is a bigot or is a racist or is therefore morally unfit to circulate in polite society that is a weapon that is people using it as a bludgeon i don't think they intend it that way but it's gotten to the point that the term is being used for reasons that are not a sign of a mature society we have a problem there yeah you write a lot about this on your sub stack which everyone should subscribe to by the way and i love <laughs> and i say that not really subscribing to anyone's stuff so <laughs> I, I I love your work and I Thank think you. I think we need voices like you and Glenn right now in this moment, particularly as we move into this conversation just naturally about racism and all of the stuff about CRT, which just kind of has been obviously you've seen this in the very online community. It's been ac in academia for decades mm -hmm. and I, it's now kind of jumped the shark and now, you know, it's the, like mm -hmm. the bogeyman on, on Fox is like CRT. Right. We must. <laughs> and they basically mean mentioning race at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It's, and this is what I've been concerned about. You and Glenn had a discussion that I've been saying for years with my friends, a lot of my friends in the comedy community, just talking about how <laughs> we're like, uh, is pointing out whiteness to everybody and like white people, is it making them focus on this a good idea? <laughs> it <laughs> seems like a really bad idea. And mm -hmm. You wrote a great piece about how criticizing CRT isn't racist, but I think right. what people are having a hard time with, and I think most people on the left, for the most part, if they're not activists or ideologues, ideologues, I don't know how to say that word. I say ideologues. <laughs> <laughs> I think I say ideologues, but we know is, what Is there a mean. correct yeah. way to say it? I, I have, have it the slightest. Okay. I hear ideologues more. But yes. that doesn't mean that there aren't other people who say ideologues. I say ideologues, but I pronounce words <laughs> wrong all the time. So I'm going to go with your, <laughs> your version. <laughs> I'm known for my mispronunciation of words. So I think what people are having a hard time, they're 
I generally think most people are good people who really do want to focus on the things that they didn't know. I think the Tulsa riots is a great example where everyone was like, what? How did we never learn about this? And Mm -hmm. then you hear about the many other riots that occurred and massacres that we never learned in our history. Mm -hmm. And I worry that with the flattening of all words, that there will be this throwing out of the baby with the bathwater. How do you how do you help people kind of parse what's happening with CRT and also maintaining this new historical perspective that I actually think is really important? Yeah, it's important to um, call people on their animus against CRT when what they really mean is why are you stirring all of this race stuff up? There's a kind of white person in particular who seems to think that Anything that we really need to talk about ended in the 60s, and maybe there's some things lying underneath, but if we let them die and we let a couple more generations die off, everything will be okay. Why is stirring that kind of stuff up? I've known people like that. They tend to not be the most educated people, and I don't mean that they're not intelligent, but you get that usually from people who aren't especially inclined to reading, who are not probably listening to NPR, et cetera. I've always associated that with education, but you hear it from certain white people or very old white people. Mm -hmm. I knew a very smart, interesting woman. She was 100. She was a 100-year-old heiress to the Pabst fortune. And so you would sit there in the the aughts talking to this person who actually remembered World War I. And it was always (laughs) very interesting talking to her. And she's well-read and, you know, she's a Democrat. But the one thing you have to kind of put up with, which I was happy to, because she was literally 100 years old, is that she thought we needed to get over the race stuff. She said Mm. Martin Luther King stirred everybody up. But, you know, she's 400 years old. Right. But (laughs) nowadays, we have to let that sort of thing go. But on the other hand, I think that to the extent that critical race theory is being used to justify treating our children in ways that we would have considered horrific just 10 minutes ago, you know, splitting them into racial groups, telling white children that they should be guilty. I can see telling a white person who's 30 that they should be guilty, although even there it's a dicey case, but saying that to a a little white girl and teaching the little black girl that she needs to be wary of the little white girl and that her fundamental identity is that of a victim. And the thing is, all of that does come directly from the tenets of critical race theory and the people who put that kind of thing across say that they are channeling critical race theory. And mm-hmm. so to say, if you don't like critical race theory, you don't want to talk about race at all and you're just a bigot is inaccurate. And once again, it's more a debate team stunt than really grappling with, I think, the excesses of critical race theory. And the worst thing is the idea that you can't criticize critical race theory unless you've read those obscure legal papers from 1978. That's just Absurd. The, the, literally, his meaning has changed. CRT's meaning has changed. In right. Way. What we should be talking about is how CRT is being used today. There are some good things about it, like Tulsa. One does want to know about it. It's funny because I, I'm getting old. I'm 55. Tulsa was discussed <laughs> a old. lot in, say, 2001. 20 right. years ago, it really got around. NPR was all over it. It was all over you know, the internet, such as it was, emails. I mean, Tulsa is not. The br- I hear what you mean, but it's not the brand new news many people are saying. But then again, you don't want to only talk about it once. And you do need to know that that happened all over the country. I personally have no problem with any of that, but I'm not sure how many school districts were planning to shield students from learning about slavery and racism in general. Right. You know, And if, if that was an epidemic, I'd like to know. But there's something wrong with these modern developments. And that's why questioning CRT should not be classified as being Rush Limbaugh. There's, right. There's Zone. That's the problem, though, is that it all the and you see these kind of bad faith interpretations of this stuff. And it's always the the loudest voices that we hear and mm-hmm. usually the most extreme. And if you aren't in the Rush Limbaugh camp, but you are everything is so polarized, even if you say, hey, I really loved your piece on this because you made what I thought was a a fantastic point about there's a big difference in teaching somebody how to think versus what to think. And this is something dangerous, not just because of you're telling kids to focus a lot on their 
immutable characteristics of the color of their skin, but there's a whole ideology that comes with this and whiteness and this sense of it's like you've mentioned and many people have mentioned this almost religious aspect to cleansing yourself of this sin. And that is like what I learned in Catholic school. You know, that yeah. that's not I they that's didn't teach me how to critically think. They taught me that I was bad <laughs> and I needed to figure out how to be good. I'm very attracted to the guilt of crit you know, I'm I'm very susceptible to these kinds of <laughs> these kinds it's of tactics. Self flagellation. Yeah. It's it's funny with these these people who are putting this sort of thing over because to get past this and to work constructively with it, we have to understand them. And for them, you say you're teaching people what to think, not how to think. And what they're thinking is, well, yes, on this one subject, yes, we're teaching them what to think because they shouldn't think anything else. To them, battling power differentials and specifically what white people have done in world history, battling that does not allow for discussion. That has to be central, just like original sin is central under a certain different philosophy. And mm -hmm. so to them, to say you're not teaching them how to think, but what to think, is like telling somebody, why don't we admit that there's some room for pedophilia? <laughs> that you know, let, let's have a discussion about it. And most of us would say, no, we're gonna we're gonna get past that. And so that's the ideology that we're dealing with in people like this. And that's why I call it religious in a way. They do think that on this particular topic, there is no such thing as how. It's only right. what. And if you don't agree with that, you are a moral pervert. The problem is I think mm. most of us know that those people are off and I don't mean crazy, but that those people's view is unsuitably narrow and frankly, often rather unreflective. It's just that we have to start having the bravery to tell people like that. That's right. Because it's gone fully mainstream. I mean, yeah. I, I was called a bigot not even an hour ago for daring to suggest <laughs> that men and women are biologically different. And I'm like, the frog is fully boiled. I don't even... <laughs> I don't actually think we realize we're why are we having this debate? It's so um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy to me. Yeah, the idea that it's okay to say really horrible things to people because of what really is a matter of opinion, <laughs> difference of opinion. We've seen so much of that since last summer in particular. And yeah, we need to we need to get brave. I think we're coming out of it. I, I have noticed since June 2020 that if you talk about most of that year and into the winter, there was a sense that if somebody uses the word white supremacy in a charismatic way, then you're supposed to just back down because you don't want to be called that on Twitter. I think it's getting to the point, especially probably because the pandemic is ending and we get to go outside and we get to spend time with real people. I think there's a pushback against this. And my idea is not that a critical race theory fan should be you know, sent to the planet Jupiter or, you know, chased out of their job. The, they want to chase the rest of us out of our jobs. I don't think they should be chased out of their jobs. They should just sit down. I want them to sit back down at the table where they were before last June. You can be a hard left voice, but be one of many voices. But you right. can't get what you want by calling people white supremacists on Twitter. That's not the way we should be operating as an artistic or a moral culture. And that's unfortunately what we've gotten to at this point. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. I was surprised to learn that health insurance doesn't always cover the full cost of an emergency medical flight. Even with comprehensive coverage, you can still get hit with substantial deductibles and co-pays. Protect your family and your finances with an Air MedCare Network membership. As a member, if an emergency arises, the expense of air medical transport is completely covered when flown by an AMCN provider. Membership costs as little as $85 a year and covers your entire household every day, even when you are away from home. That's just pennies a day. If this podcast series has taught us anything, it's that the unexpected can happen. An AMCN membership is protection no family should be without. For a limited time, as a Walk-In's Welcome listener, you'll get up to a $50 e-gift card when you join. Simply visit airmedcarenetwork.com forward slash welcome and use offer code welcome. How did you come about your own belief system and ideas about all of this? You came up in academia, correct? So, sort of. Sort yeah. of? Yeah, my, my parents, yeah. Okay. So did you, yeah, just to tell me a little bit about your, I wonder, were you, were you pretty like classically liberal and then suddenly everything shifted and now suddenly you're just like the, mm -hmm. like you on, you know, you're, you're the Rush Limbaugh. 
fan? I'm, I'm still big. <laughs> it's the pictures that got small. Yeah, it's um, I was and am a liberal. Um, yeah. I always have been uh, about race and everything else. It's just that at a certain point, and this actually started around when I was born, although my birth didn't cause it, the basic <laughs> idea yes, about, did. yeah, I was born and suddenly <laughs> the norm on race became hard left. You know, the mm. idea is that the norm on race is radical. And so it means that if I have views like mine, I'm a right winger. Although there's nothing that I believe about race that would have been seen as at all unusual in you know, this time travel theme. If you're you know, sitting in a living room with civil rights leaders in 1961, you know, there's no color then, you know, because everything's in black and white. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting there with them and I'm wearing those cat glasses and you know, <laughs> drinking martinis. None of them would have thought of me as a conservative at all. They would have thought of me as a normal Adlai Stevenson voting liberal. Nowadays, many people see me as this right winger, and that's because of the, the ideology. What it is with me, and, and Glenn and I have explored this sort of thing to an extent, is that I'm not a joiner. And right. it's less that I grew up with academics. My mother was an academic, was one of the most brilliant people I've ever known and extremely well read. She wasn't in academia per se, though. So I was kind of a fat rat, but it, it, not quite. But I was a a, a readaholic. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've always had you know, friends and everything, but I'm not a joiner. I don't get that feeling that I can see most people get that you don't, you're not legitimate, that there's something wrong if you're not in the warm embrace of a group. And so for me, honestly, what I think is that I saw that race was much better in terms of how America handled it as I grew up, as I came of age in the 80s. I thought, Boy, you can see those things happening in Selma. You can look at the 50s. Look how far we've come based on what all those people died and got hurt to give us. Mm -hmm. And then gradually realizing as I, it was in my mid-20s and then in, in, in my 30s, that most people in my position thought that not that much had changed. And this is going to sound arrogant, but frankly, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that it's not true. It's mm -hmm. obvious that people like that are exaggerating. And I thought, no, they're not crazy, but I could not listen to their anger and think to myself, I'd rather be one of them and say the things they want to hear so that I can have a sense of warmth and community than to think what I think. And it wasn't so much that I thought I marched to the beat of a different drummer. I was thinking, I'm looking at reality through my perfectly sane eyes. For some reason, they aren't. And that's when I wrote Losing the Race, because I'm mm. not one to say these people are crazy, they're poverty pimps, they want to profit off of this. No, it was clear that these were perfectly normal people. But I thought, why does anybody think that we are at such a terrible place on race when we clearly aren't? And that was the beginning of me being a quote unquote race pundit. And that's where I still am now. It's not that racism doesn't exist, but we've been taught to obsess with it and to propose that it has a power that I quite simply think it doesn't have. And my hope, and this took a little longer than I wanted it to, but I thought Shelby Steele and Glenn Lowry's work showed me that I could say these things and not be crazy. Right. And then I thought, and I want to give that to people younger than me. And for a while, I was worried it wasn't going to happen. The social media, the ta Coates fan club, for a while, I was thinking it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But now it is happening. There are people like Camille Foster and Coleman Hughes yep. and Chloe Valdery. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they read me and were inspired just by me, but they are people who are a generation or more younger than me. And they're realizing they can say, they can speak, frankly, truth. It's just the truth that right. we've come a long, long way, not just a little bit of the way, a long way, and not feel like there's something wrong with them. And I hope, I hope that keeps going because we can't really progress until we stop the exaggerating. So mm -hmm. for me, it's always just been, I was comfortable telling the truth because I don't mind being hated, but to an extent. And I don't need that embrace that most people seem to need. And that's bad in my life in some ways, I suppose. But I'd rather be me on this because I think that a lot of why people exaggerate about race is seeking a kind of group fellowship. Mm -hmm. I get it. I do that in other ways, but I just was never able to do that on the race question. So that's a sloppy answer. 
No, it's very articulate and like brilliant as usual. Everything just seems to come so effortlessly out of your mouth when I hear you talking. I'm like, he's just <laughs> talking. <laughs> it's not so even. Funny. I literally, literally, I don't hear it that way, but some people say that. Thank it you. just That's sounds just so effortless. It's just, it's a, you clearly think very deeply about these things, but also, were you bullied as a kid? <laughs> you know, oddly enough, no. No. And it, it's funny. I You would expect that I would have been. There were, in both of the neighborhoods I grew up in, black boys who thought I was a little ridiculous and gave me a hard time to an extent. Mm -hmm. Never bullying. You know, I never got beat up. Nobody ever chased me out into the street. It was never torture. I was never, you know, call things over and over. I had some some tension, but the truth is, you know, talk about words, you know, flowing out of my mouth. I look back and I realized that I actually was pretty good at talking them away. I could use whatever this thing is about me and talking. And I found that I actually could make those people back down. It was partly that I'd never encountered people who were trying to beat my face in. I mean, I don't know how well words would have worked. But I remember there was one of these menacing guys in my first neighborhood who just liked to, you know, give me a bit of a hard time because I was I was a little effeminate, especially before my voice cracked. I was I kind of talked like this and I like books and everything. <laughs> and he said some stuff to me. He, he may have called me a faggot or something like that. And I said, Steve, you know what you are? And I looked him right in the eye. And it's something that people always should realize. Look people in the eye. It throws them off. I looked him right in the eye and I said, Steve, you know what? You're a damn bastard. And I kept looking. And, you know, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't run up and hit me. He just kind of went and turned away. I guess something about my voice made it work. Another time, this is going to sound terrible, but the next people who did it, and I'm on the 12 or 13. And somebody was giving me a bit of a hard time, called me a couple of names. And I said, you know what's interesting? I'm not going to use his name, so I'll call him Robert. You know what's interesting, Robert? One day, you're going to be asking me for a job. And I said, <laughs> literally, I said, think about it. Think about what you are now and what I am now. One day, you're going to have to ask me for a job or a favor. And do you realize that I'm not going to give you that favor? <laughs> and I just kind of walked away. He never spoke to me again. That's and so somehow right. that sort of thing worked for me. So no, I was not um, bullied. And unlike what some people think, a lot of my views on race are not me getting back at the little girl who smacked me like this several times at the behest of her big brother because I spelled concrete properly. That wasn't pain. I wasn't being bullied. And right. you know, I got along very well with those kids as I got older. No, oddly enough, but I think I was lucky. I, I, was, I was wondering only because it's such a it's a feature of somebody who's not too concerned with being in a group. I moved every year and a half and oh, I yeah. was always bullied and I was always the fly on the wall in a new school. And so right. I was able to see these systems. I'm like, Hey, if you want somebody to come to a cocktail party with you and evaluate the social hierarchy in that room in under five minutes, I'm your girl. Exactly. Yeah. That's what happens when you're that kind of person. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so I think you do end up becoming, I just became distrustful of groups in general. So I, I still think I have that uh, rejected girl who didn't belong energy playing out, but I definitely am distrustful of groups as well so i'm i'm much because i was bullied and always on the out group i'm very comfortable living in this kind of weird nebulous space where i don't necessarily feel like i have a group um, yeah and that would be me too yeah. yeah yeah and it doesn't mean that i don't have friends it doesn't mean that i'm disconnected but yeah that's uh, i envy it in people i look at people who have a community who have a we to refer to and I can't say that I've ever truly felt that I had that, including black, in that I have had many, many, many black friends, and I still do. It's not a complete disconnection. But to the extent that blackness is associated, frankly, with two things, one, devout Christianity, which I, mm -hmm. I can't do either. And two, the idea of whites as a menacing second reality. To the extent that that is a great many black people, I'm not with it. I don't believe it. I think that it's not necessary. And so, yeah, I am not somebody who spontaneously has a sense of a we. Mm. And it's good in some ways, but wouldn't it be nice to be somebody who is part of this warm group? But yes. in order to be part of it, you'd have 
I don't, I don't know. I have to believe things that I don't believe. And so, you know, I'll just be solitary. I look, I so I look at my, you know, cousins. I have big and they went to sororities and they have these massive <laughs> groups of friends and like a surprise party, you know, for me, that's like the <laughs> pinnacle of like having a group as someone threw you a surprise party and, you're yeah, like, and all your friends come um, right. <laughs> and they're like, hooray. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> and you know, it's like, this is not something yeah, we're not going to get that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to throw us a surprise party other than maybe to like jump me and that is speaking event you have this great line in your 2019 talk at bard college um you're being taught to pretend that you're weaker than you are and this is something that i see reflected in our culture i see it in particularly gen z and younger it's fascinating to me i read my grandfather's letters from world war ii pretty much regularly because here he is being bombed underway for days and weeks and months at a time and brushes it off. And he's like, well, I'd hate to make everybody back home a nervous stew, you know? <laughs> and he feels <laughs> guilty that he's even talking about himself and he doesn't want anybody to worry. And now it's, it's completely the opposite. Now everybody's waving their mental illness diagnosis and their medication list and their everything on, on their, LinkedIn or whatever their their TikTok bio, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not LinkedIn. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> They're on their way. That generation will be listing that. <laughs> oh, it'll LinkedIn. be on your resume. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For me, as somebody who ended up in rehab at nineteen and could have blamed a lot of people for, for failing their own duties as adults or teachers or whatever, and bad things that happened to me. Realize in a moment sitting in a room with 40 women and wondering how I got there, straight A student, that I still needed to build a life no matter who there was to blame. And I was grateful to have this. This, this was a halfway house and all these lesbians ran it and they kicked my ass. They did not see any kind of, they saw right through my bullshit. They saw how I was trying to hide. And I think. I realized that, you know, I still had to work through that trauma, pain and experience, but I, it couldn't hold me back. What I see now with all these younger kids in particular, the depression, the anxiety, that women in particular who are being told that men are evil and all of this stuff like that victimhood mentality is a dead end. Do you see any way out of this? Yeah, um, you're hitting something that I started thinking about just recently, as you might know from my Substack, this victimization mindset, which mm -hmm. psychologists are well aware of. Mm -hmm. Understandably, not many of them are willing to apply it openly to race questions to sustain it, or at least American race questions, because you're, you're going to lose your career. But that clearly is a way of being human that has acquired a major purchase on the American public and some other publics today. It's not only about race, as you're saying. The idea that you're supposed to be proud to emblazon bad things that happen to you and their permanent effect upon you in skywriting. That the most interesting thing about you is how you've been fucked up. Mm -hmm. And that is really much newer than I think many people understand. And mm. I find it it's peculiar. It's, it's damaging. It goes against what we're thought of as basic tenets of psychological sanity. Like I've had problems in my life. You know, my, my parents were very difficult people, nothing abusive, but they were very difficult people. And, you know, I, I've had teens where I was, wasn't bullied, but I had some awkward stuff. And, you know, then 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, I'm recently divorced. There are all sorts of things I could talk about that haven't gone well. The last thing I would want to do is write a book about it. I would just figure what would anyone learn from listening to what I did about my problems? And why would I want to depict my life as most interesting because of those things. You know, some people say they wish I would write a life story. Some of them want it because they want me to write about how I as a black man triumphed over racism. And that would be a very, very thin book. Mm -hmm. But then I think some of them want to know about what my problems have been. I don't want to share that. I'm not mm -hmm. embarrassed. You know, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But yeah, there's a version of me today who would be eager to share what, what he'd been through. Mm -hmm. And with that being the most interesting thing about him, 
as opposed to the things that went well, the things that he accomplished, the things that he likes. That is a new way, I'll bet, of mm. being human in the history of our species. I'll bet that has not happened with Homo sapiens until roughly about 25 years ago, that the victimization mindset becomes default among whole generation and a half of people. Right. And I think there's something wrong with it. We need to find a more constructive way of talking about it. Other than, for example, the quote unquote good white person today who will listen to a black person, just exaggerating, vastly exaggerating the extent to which racism has something to do with something. And the person sits there and nods and thinks, I can't know what they're going through. Deep down, that person knows that what they're looking at is a performance. We need to get that kind of person more comfortable with saying the victimization mindset is something you should seek help with. I understand how you feel, but this doesn't correspond to the reality that we're grappling with, even if racism does exist. And you need you need help to, to get past this exaggeration of your victimhood. Mm. I hope that can happen, but we have to be able to talk about it. It has to be a meme. Most people don't know that psychologists know of something called the victimization mindset. That right. needs to get out there, just like we know that there's something called the autism spectrum. This is something that we need to all know about. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Walk-Ins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you get a great rate on car insurance, even if it's not with them. They have this nifty comparison tool that puts rates side by side, so you choose a rate and coverages that work for you. So let's say you're interested in lowering your rate on your car insurance. Visit Progressive.com to get a quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's rate and then... Their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and easy to compare so that all you have to do is choose the rate and coverages you like. Progressive gives you options so you can make the best choice for you. You could be looking forward to saving money in the very near future. More money for, say, a pair of noise-canceling headphones, an Instapot, more puzzles, whatever brings you joy. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. It's one small step you can do today that could make a big impact on your budget tomorrow. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. It's really fascinating to me because I was in rehab, as I mentioned, at 19, and I do openly talk about a lot of my struggles, but it might be the most interesting thing about me. If it <laughs> is, Okay. But yeah, it, I mean, but it's also more because I find that people resonate with a hero's journey. So I'm not in it as where I feel the modern, there's a big difference between being victimized and mm -hmm. adopting a victimhood mentality forever. Definitely, definitely, and yeah. when I was in rehab, I remember saying I was the only white girl among 40 women. And these are women who had been through a lot of shit. They were in and out. Basically, this rehab that I went to, it was general. I had to put myself on welfare basically to get into it. Um, I got kicked off my insurance and I was over 18. So I put myself on welfare, went here, and it was the last stop before jail for many of these people. And this is a system they had been in and out of. And I was in group therapy with many of these women hearing stories that would horrify anybody. And I felt like I couldn't share because I understood I was privileged. And I, I just found my journals from rehab and I said, wow, I, what's my problem? I'm just a spoiled white girl. Those exact words. And mm -hmm. the, the, in that rehab, not only did the therapist call me out on this, they said, yes, you've had some advantages, but you thinking that you can't share your pain and your story because somehow they had it worse not only holds you back from your own healing in your own story, but it's also racist. <laughs> and th that would not be the rhetoric today. That is an astonishingly valuable story for two reasons. One, that it sounds like another planet today, that that's what the response to that would be. Nowadays, you would be celebrated for you know singing the critical race theory gospel and being a good white girl. And two, at that time, you already knew that you were a white girl with a certain privilege, whereas we're often taught today that that white girl would have no idea that she needed to be taught that to be white is to be somebody who's had certain advantages over, you know, 39 black and Latina, I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. women. And yeah, it's not the message that whiteness is power 
is hardly as brand new as many people are implying, even among perfectly ordinary people who do not have PhDs in critical race theory. Right. And yet we're often told that to be white is to just have no blessed idea. I think that's been vastly exaggerated. I think that that vast exaggeration comes from an almost communal victimization complex on the part of the black people who say this and the white people who are fellow travelers who encourage us in saying that. White people know the expression, oh God, that's so white said with a sneer. That goes back to the 90s. That right. is an awareness right there. I remember noticing that then and thinking of it as progress. Mm. You know, the, the very upper middle class white undergraduate at Stanford, when I was getting my degree at Stanford, I did a lot of theater there. So I knew a lot of undergrads and they were some very pampered people. But those Genevieve's and, and, and Julie's, <laughs> those women knew that they were white. They got it. You know, their mothers didn't, but they, they they understood that even then. And yet then 20 years later, it's as if no one knows. You know, mm -hmm. that movie White Girls mm -hmm. was actually kind of an indication of that whole thing. The whole country loved that movie, partly out of an awareness that whiteness is power. And yet we're being told that no one's ever known. We're always pretending it's 1956. Well, and, and it, it yeah. Isn't. It's so funny because when I started sharing my own stories of my upbringing, <laughs> the women were like, and I've shared this before, I just will never forget being in a group therapy session. And I was so afraid and ashamed to share. And then they're like, white people are fucked up. <laughs> and, you know, suddenly they're laughing at me. And I was like, yeah, this is why it was racist for me. They're just, I had my friend coach T came on and he was just so brilliant. He's just a dude from LA and he was talking about, he's like, white people are cheesy. He's like in this whole mentality is the assumption that I would want to be white. He's like, they're cheesy. They can't dance. I want no part of this. Like I, he's like, I find it offensive that you assume I would want any of that in a white man. And I was dying laughing because it's so basic, you know, just in it, in these assumptions we're making, it comes from, and I just spoke with Jonathan Haidt and he was saying, if you want, you know, to, to get this kind of message of white supremacy out, you're going to pass around Robin D'Angelo and Ibram X. Kendi's book to every person in America and have them. It, it starts with this premise of white is better, which it's is problematic. <laughs> it's just astonishing. Yeah. To really take in those books messages to, to make it seem as if white hegemony is just so powerful and such an in, ineradicable stain. And yet these are treated as great works of literature. It's astonishing to me. It Robin D'Angelo's book, that's literally, well, I, actually, the worst book I ever read was <laughs> a book called, I'm not going to say what it was called because if this guy is still alive, he doesn't deserve it, but it was about why certain cartoon characters got their names. And oh, the boy. thing is, he never, he never knew why. And so I remember with Daffy Duck, it was, well, probably they called him Daffy Duck because he was kind of a Daffy character. It, just went <laughs> on like that. it was a whole book full of that. And that was the worst book I've ever read. That was about 30 years ago. The second worst book was White Fragility. I mean, truly mm -hmm. a horridly reasoned, talk about cheesy little thing that you would expect to find like in the back of some airport bookstore <laughs> yeah, just a, and yet because it assuages people's white guilt and i'm gonna leave poor kendy alone because mm -hmm. um i'm 15 years older than him and i've been mean enough to him already in print and, and frankly he he is an advertisement against himself but mm -hmm. yes those books teach white people uh, teach black people to think of white people as all powerful in a way that wouldn't have made any sense to anybody as recently as 20 25 years ago. We live in a weird time, hopefully conditioned by everybody being on Zoom since last spring. I think a lot of this is because we haven't been in the world. I so. hope so. I mean, I was talking to my therapist and she was saying she's having a hard time with the younger generations coming in. And because of all this, this language and just the way that everybody's adopted these therapeutic language terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent five minutes on Clubhouse and I was like, come for the group therapy and stay for the struggle session because that's exactly what it turned into. <laughs> but I'm it so was sorry. really, it was really just, you know, like this is a safe space and uh, all of this language, it's also kind of jumped mainstream. And she said that they're so attached to their victim mentality and their story and that the belief that their feelings are the truth and that mm -hmm. no one can really walk in their shoes. It's very challenging with this generation to, and because now they're being taught that words like grit 
our language of the white supremacist. Exactly. How dare how, you be asked to try? How it? do you right. even fight it? How do yeah. you? That's why I started this podcast, and it's because I want people to hear stories of grit and resilience. And now it's like white supremacist language, Bridget. It's so so sad. This idea that to really try hard to be precise is a white imposition. And I just <laughs> wonder what world are these people waiting for? And I literally imagine that some of these people think the world could be run by people dancing and you know being expressive in ways that don't really lead to anything. And in, you know, I guess empathy is supposed to somehow invent things. Like what what world would this be if we got rid of all these white things such as music theory and math and showing up on time and <laughs> you know and emotional restraint and abstract thought? I don't I don't get it. I don't know what world and the thing is these people aren't even thinking about the world. No, it's what they're not. doing is enjoying not liking white people, even if they're white. And this is just not the way we can run a mature society. This is just this is backwards. What do you think about banning CRT? Um I don't think that we should ban making people aware that there are power differentials in society and that white people have been on top and that that is something that is ingrained in society in ways that wouldn't even occur to you that we're fish who don't know we're wet. All of that is right. true. When I first learned these things, I didn't think, oh, that's terrible. I remember thinking it's not much fun because it really does basically make you feel guilty for enjoying anything about the Western life that you liked. But just because it's not fun doesn't mean it's wrong. Right. It's just it being used to pervert the minds of young people, it being used to choke off whole disciplines of thought in universities into anti-racism academies, basically the, the lack of reflection and the lack of basic curiosity in this philosophy, whatever it's good for, and it's good for some things, it shouldn't be the focus of an entire classics department, right. of an entire theater department. Critical race theory is what the entire theatrical training program is going to be about. <laughs> That's stop. That's stop. So ban CRT? No. Kimberly Crenshaw's work should be read. But ban the way it's been being used, especially since June 2020, among mainstream people who think of themselves as ahead of the curve. I would ban that. Unfortunately, our terminology is going to remain sloppy. But Right. Yeah. It's so hard because it's the there. I love the disingenuous argument that this is not being taught by people who are accepting many thousands of dollars to go teach it. And, and yes, it's just exactly crazy. Yeah, there's nothing to be afraid of, you know, not happening in my district, etc. I think there's enough of a pushback against this that we're going to be able to at least argue on some basis of fact in the near future about these things. My hope is that people rediscover the hero's journey or something, because I think that the dead end of victimhood, it almost feels to me like the culture itself. I can only liken it to when I was circling the drain in addiction. And I'm not exactly sure what our rock bottom looks like, but we're going to have to hit rock bottom on this, this whole vibe in order to heal or in order to realize that you're sitting wherever you're sitting, you're still going to have to build a life, whether you're at Chaz in Minneapolis or burning some building down in Portland, you still have to put together a life in some way. And it's much easier to do in a society that's functioning than one that is not functioning. <laughs> I would have to agree with that statement. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I know you have to go and I just really appreciate you and everything you're doing. Where can we find you online? Well, um, thank you, Bridget. I'm at Substack these days. And so johnwater.substack.com. I still write for the Atlantic. And so that's there too. Then there are my talks with Glenn. I need, I do too much stuff. There are my talks with Glenn and that's every two weeks. And then I do my language podcast, which is called Lexicon Valley. Um, that's not about language and society. It's just, you know, geeky linguistic stuff with jokes and me bringing my daughters on and stuff. And that's at Slate. It is about to be at Substack as well. It's moving to booksmartstudios.org, which is going to be a family of podcasts at Substack. Lexicon Valley is going to start appearing there. Cool. But it will be fundamentally the same show. And so you can find me in all those places. You can have either me as geeky linguist or me as contrarian race commentator or me as something in between, but I'm in those places. 
You know what? We're we're very similar, you and I, actually. And we have a lot of, <laughs> we contain multitudes. I wish people would remember that we, we all contain multitudes. There's lots in all of us. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I really just appreciate your voice in the world so much. We need it. I hope more and more people learn of your work and your sub stack and, your, and just your calming voice of reason in this turbulent time i think a lot of that's why so many people are fans of yours and my community in particular which is very you know politically homeless i think there are certain people who are saying calling kind of the the insanity out and you you have a larger ripple effect than you might know I'm glad to hear that, Bridget. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And we'll hopefully talk again if you have another book we or can. something coming. That's which coming I know in you're working on. Oh, it's coming. It's called Woke Racism and it's coming oh. out in October. And we can talk then. I had two oh. books this year the Cursing Book and the Contrarian Book. And so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait for that one. Uh, it's time for the weekly check in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. So. I was at the Hollywood Bowl for the 4th of July. Uh huh. And I was wearing my American flag leggings that I'm obsessed with. Uh huh. And a USA headband that my aunt gave me <laughs> because she was a raver in a past life. Yeah, she always <laughs> has these like light up accessories, <laughs> <laughs> like a whole bag of them. And talking to this woman who was in the box next to us. There were these women and like there was some confusion about the tickets and but they were really funny and we ended up just chatting with them and we weren't even talking about anything political or anything. It was just like, isn't it nice to be at the bowl and everybody's so cheerful and yay, uh -huh. the bowl is magic uh -huh. and just the magic of the bowl. And then this woman says, can I ask you a question and I hope it doesn't offend you. Uh -huh. And I thought she was going to say, are you pregnant or something? You know, she was a boomer. So I'm like, oh, great. Here comes some question about my body. That's uh -huh. completely inappropriate because <laughs> boomers have no boundaries in that regard. Uh -huh. And she said, are you a Republican? <laughs> in L.A., that can be a very offensive she question. She whispered it. She specifically <laughs> whispered it. And I started dying laughing. And I said, why would you ask me that question? <laughs> And she said, I just don't see people of your age, like young people, people, I don't even want to say young people because I said young people on Twitter and everyone's like, nice story so you can humble brag. I'm like, you guys are all idiots. But she did say, she was like, I just don't see young people where, you know, showing patriotism or wow. people your age. Wow. I'm not even young. No. But wow. I mean, by I mean, yes, we yes, like we I'm are, young but. by standards of it's all relative. Right. If you're like 70 or 40, 40 is like is I young. give yeah. anything to be 40 again. Mm -hmm. Then I was dying laughing about that. What did you say to her? I didn't really answer the question because. I was more interested in her thoughts on why she thought it was that young people don't show patriotism. Uh -huh. She was like, I just don't see people who are so patriotic who are your age and who are so excited about America anymore. And it was just strange because I'd been thinking so much about this with the one woman who turned away from the flag at the Olympics. Uh -huh. And I'm kind of on the fence with, like, I don't care. I think one of the inherent great things about America is that you can talk shit about America. Right. You know, it's like right. that is the freedom yes. to shit on your country, even if it makes you look like an idiot. And it is my freedom to say you are an entitled, spoiled brat. Who has no idea how good you have it. Right. Yes. And I'm, I have, I have more tolerance for it for like professional sports than I do at the Olympics mm -hmm. because it's like, what did, exactly did you think you were representing at the Olympics? Right, you are representing <laughs> your country. You're literally representing your flag. Right. It's like a soft war between, it's a friendly war between countries. Right. It's just ridiculous. Right. So I, I have a lot less sympathy and understanding. And even still, I'm like, all right. Still, it's your, your prerogative to do so. But yes. it's still just like, put them in the gulag. <laughs> Now I understand why dictators exist <laughs> and where they come from. But so 
It was just a funny, she was saying she thinks she, then it comes out that her husband was Israeli hmm. and he loved America. He came from Israel and he just thought it was the best country. And then she started talking about all the anti-Semitism and she was like, I can't even talk about, she was like, I'm just sick of it. I'm sick of all these liberals. <laughs> I was like, are you a Republican? <laughs> <laughs> And she never answered. But me. that's where people go when they get, when they feel like they're being inundated by being told how they should behave or how they should speak or how they should, right. they, they rebel by swinging in the opposite direction. So the piece I'm trying to write or should be writing as we speak right now, because of course I'm on deadline perpetually, is... I wanted to write, can you love America and be liberal? Because it seems like you can't. Wow. That's that's so sad to me. That's so sad to me. Because I do feel like, you know, I'm listening to John McWhorter's podcast with you right now. And so I'm in the process of editing it. And just the, the podcast you just listened to. Yes, yes. <laughs> I am in the process of editing it right now. And I just was listening to you guys talk about how, you know, you grew up in the 90s in the likes phase and whatnot. But I feel like in our gener our generation, our age group, it was still very like we were still very patriotic. Like that's the way we that's the way I was raised. I was always kind of proud of my country and, you know, the salute to the flag at school every morning and just all that stuff. I I'm sad for how politicized it's become to why can't we still love our country and acknowledge that there are many problems that still need to be worked on and fixed? What is wrong with that? Well, there was that article in the New York Times that came out that, of course, I didn't read, but I saw the headline, <laughs> and it was all about how the flag is this thing that makes neighbors uncomfortable now because all of whatever. It was stupid, and it was got widely dunked on. And I was thinking about how I was raised, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, just with both views. So I had a very, right, I had a mother right. who identified as European basically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and a dad who was very patriotic, and obviously our grandparents were uber patriotic. Right. And so I feel like I was exposed to that the seeds of what the liberalism has kind of sprouted in the past couple of decades. But it was more just my mom romanticizing the idea of what it was like to be European. like a French yes. European. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, they love life and they enjoy themselves and they don't value these stupid things like, you know, buying stuff. And she just kind of looked down on our values as Americans. I just feel like the more I the more I learned in school and beyond especially just as a woman being like thank god I was born in America you know yeah. the the freedoms I enjoy and the idea that you know I've talked to my mom before about kind of the sexism that she endured and she was right on the cusp of when in this in her first year of college the women's dorms had curfew and you had to like sign in and there were no boys allowed and all this stuff by like her junior year that was all done away with. Wow. Like she was literally within the sexual revolution of what was going on. And and just talking to her about kind of, you know, what what were you ever harassed at work? And she was like, oh, God, yeah. And just that kind of having the ability to grow up and never for one second feel like I can't do something because I'm a woman. Right. Like that was not a thing that was ever. Well, if you were me. growing up now, it would be a thing. Right. <laughs> Which is crazy to me. I look, like, why are we regressing? I don't know. It's weird too, because obviously not everyone experiences America the same way. Right. Of course not. So there's plenty of poor Appalachian Appal Appalachians. <laughs> Appalachians. I don't know. <laughs> this is a microaggression. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like some Appalachians. Why do you have to single out the Appalachian? <laughs> Appalachians. <laughs> <laughs> some poor rural. 
Just because they're kind of the the trope <laughs> of the poor white. The poor white trope. Um, or obviously people who grew up on reservations. Mm-hmm. Are you allowed to call them reservations? Yeah, they're that's what they are, aren't they? I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what to call the Native American Indians. <laughs> but I just call them all three. Just <laughs> Because they call themselves Americans. Oh shit! No, no, I think Native they call American, themselves Native Americans. Indigenous yeah, Indians. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but there are places in the world where a woman can't go outside without being accompanied by a, a male family member. You I know, had conversations and covered with head to toe. Young men in India who are like, "Well, of course you're going to get raped if you're out late and a woman." Like yeah. that is a young man's psychology and that's what they believe is true still in india yeah places yeah that you're asking for it and they have the right to rape you yeah or you're you're just gonna get raped that's part of the way the world works yeah that's crazy that's crazy no we live in a very free society so i don't really know how to make 900 words out of this brain salad because it does seem like the anti-american sentiment it's very strange when it comes from inside the house yeah because i'm used to it coming from outside the house right and obviously america has done many questionable things and meddled in countries where it had no business meddling right even reading Glenn Greenwald's book and the history of Brazil and South America. I'm like, what the like this shit is so beyond messed up our CIA and all of the things that we were doing down in Central and South America. It is just bananas. Uh And I just think obviously these things like we're I know we're not a perfect country. But there's no claim that we are. Even if you say you love our country, that's not saying that you believe it's perfect. The, no. the two are not automatically linked, but for some reason in people's minds now they are, or if you love your country, you're automatically a Republican. That's really what it is. Right. It's less about can you love your country and be liberal? It's more about if you do love your country, you're probably considered a conservative or or an independent, maybe. I And that to me... I'm like, okay, then this is a fad, you know, like it, then it's just like people jumping on the bandwagon of a, as a fad of now it's cool to shit on your country and look down on America and be like, oh, this country is so terrible and not have any pride or gratitude for the environment in which the height of privilege is being able to shit on America. Exactly. Like, you don't even know where you come from. Right. Go live somewhere else then. Go. Please. Yeah, please. If you hate this country so much, go find somewhere else to live. I wish they would. <laughs> but that's also, it's very, you know, it divides people and polarizes people and puts people in camps and tribes. And then, you know, I'm, you're looking at someone being like, go get out of here then. Go back to where <laughs> you came from, Portland. No, I get it. I think you I think you can hold your country accountable. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you want to burn it all down and these people want to like it, it's like Nancy Rommelman said. There's the people who gen- genuinely are the agitators are apolitical. Mm-hmm. They don't care. They right. want to burn it all down. They just like They chaos. want to see the destruction of the United States of America. Right. I think that holding your country accountable is one of the highest forms of loving it. Yeah. You know? I agree. Just because I love someone or something doesn't mean I think that it's beyond reproach. You hold them to a high standard. I was reading Grandpa's letter that he wrote on Veterans Day, or it was one of the holidays where he spoke many years. Yeah, after the war. Yeah. And he just had such a good perspective about America. Maybe I should put some of that in this piece like that an excerpt from it that's a good idea takes up words <laughs> <laughs> no he it's just like the ending really moves me of that every time i read it fucking helicopter every time we record anything there's a freaking helicopter circling a overhead helicopter. 
helicopter, yeah. That's not a good sign. Last week, Maggie's like, your neighborhood's going to shit. I'm like, Casey had noticed Los Angeles is going <laughs> to Angeles shit. Los Angeles is going to shit. There was a dude pacing back and forth across the street in front of my apartment yesterday, screaming, just like yelling, uh, uh, like, fuck it, fuck it. Just yeah, like back and forth, sad. back and forth, uh, yelling at himself or uh, whatever. It was just, it's disturbing. Mm-hmm. It's like living in a mental world. Yeah, it's watching the like <laughs> slow deterioration of the, <laughs> the fabric of yes. society. LA is a little bit like living in a mental world. It is, and it's becoming more and more apparent by the day. Anyway, now that we've reached the apocalypse, it's time to sign off. I've been getting stockpiling stuff, more supplies. It's not going to do any good in this no, not city. in this city. I asked my aunt and uncle when we were at the bowl if they had a plan. And they're like, no. I was like. <laughs> you guys are going to be the first to go. Yeah. I'd be worried if I were you. <laughs> Whose neighborhood do you think they're coming to first? Not uh-huh, mine. Uh-huh. Mine's going to be hit like second wave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life. Help you get out of your own way and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)